Thank you. You may be seated. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Those are powerful words. I hope you can sing them with conviction that you know that Christ died for you. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of scripture that we read just a few moments ago. Exodus chapter 4. And for those of you who wonder when this will ever cease, <laughs> this is the last week, by the grace of God, <laughs> on the covenant in the land. There's a lot more we can say, but 13 weeks is a quarter, and so like Sunday school materials run for a quarter, this is not Sunday school, and nor did I get these from a Sunday school quarterly, but uh, we'll stop after 13 weeks. And so we're in Exodus chapter 6, and looking at verses 4 through 6, the last week, of course, was Reformation Sunday. And on Reformation Sunday, we preached a message on faith without works is dead, from James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Very important message, and I'm going to just summarize a few things that we learned last week because they tie in with what we're looking at in the covenant and the land. We learned that James is not in conflict with the battle cry of the Reformation, justification by faith alone. In fact, he's in perfect agreement with the clarion declaration from the book of Habakkuk, quoted by Paul in both Romans and Galatians, the just shall live by faith. It doesn't say the just shall be saved by faith. It says the just shall live by faith. That's rather important. Living by faith means walking by faith. That's the visible proof that we have faith. The entire list of heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 contains men and women who gave visible proof of their internal faith to the world around them because of what they did. They had works that proved they had internal faith. In addition to those truths, we also learned nine additional things. Number one, justification means to be declared righteous, not made righteous. That's the doctrine of imputation. Imputation is what makes you righteous. It's a Greek bookkeeping term whereby certain things are transferred from one account to another account. And our sins were transferred to the account of Christ, and Christ's righteousness was transferred to our account. That's what made us righteous in the sight of God. That's the doctrine of imputation. Justification is the declaration that we are righteous. In the sight of God, we are declared righteous by our faith. He can see our hearts. But in the sight of men, which is what James is dealing with, we are declared righteous by our works. Thou wilt say, O vain man, and James makes it very clear, he's talking about what people will say when they see us in the context of what we do. Not merely what we talk about, but how does it affect our lives? As you know my famous question, you say you're a Christian? Well, how has it changed your life? Genuine faith always results in works of righteousness. Justification is very clearly distinguished in James chapter 2. He talks about justification by works in the sight of people, and then he talks about how Abraham had imputed righteousness by his faith in the sight of God, as you get to the end of the chapter. James makes it clear that we are justified in the sight of God by faith, in contrast to being justified in the sight of men by our works. James makes it clear that justification by faith is not the same thing as having a head knowledge about God and believing that he's there because even the demons believe in the true God and tremble and they're not going to heaven. They don't have genuine faith. If you're a real Christian with genuine faith, you will do good works because God has predestined the specific good works that you will do. You know Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. You know, all of you know verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But then verse 10 goes on, For we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus, created unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that's predestination, before ordained that we should walk in them. You, if you are a real Christian, and not a phony Christian, one who has convinced himself or herself that, yeah, I think I'm on my way to heaven, you will do good works because God has predestinated them to be in your life. 
And God's predestinating purposes are never foiled. And God will produce in you and through you, by the power of his Holy Spirit, the good works that bring glory to Jesus Christ. James is not in conflict with the rest of the Bible. Paul is teaching there in Ephesians chapter 2, our very famous verse about, you know, our, by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It, that is, faith is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You didn't earn your salvation. James agrees. Our imputation... Where we are made righteous is by faith, and he gives that in the same chapter, James chapter 2, which we talked about last week. Good works are not defined by the world. Good works contain four basic elements. We studied those last week. Number one, good works are works that are done by faith. That's the whole point. Number two, good works are done in obedience to the word of God. Because faith, the definition of faith, is complete confidence in the word of God. We give an illustration of it. We see the declaration of it in Hebrews 11. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But if you look at every place in the Bible, and I did this at one point, went through and said, what is the bottom line between all of these passages where faith is spoken of? Faith is complete confidence in the word of God. Saving faith is created in the elect by what the sovereign God reveals himself to be. I wrote that definition almost 40 years ago. Had everybody in the church memorize it. Wish you guys would memorize it too. It will help you understand what the Word of God says. Anyway, moving on. Number three. Good works are works that are done, not only by faith, not only in obedience to the Word of God, but they are done in the power of the Holy Spirit. If you do your works in the power of the flesh, they are not good works. In your flesh dwells no good thing. Everything done in the flesh is as filthy rags. Number four. Works that are done to the glory of God. If you do it to the glory of yourself, to the glory of anybody else, it is not a good work. Four tests for good works. Done by faith, done in obedience to the word of God, done in the power of the Holy Spirit, and done to the glory of God. We saw that Jesus gave the parable of the sower, the seed, and the different types of soil. And the soil, as we saw, represents the hearts and the lives of men. And the good soil always produces a crop. The amount of the crop is varied. Jesus said some bring forth 30-fold, some bring forth 60-fold, some bring forth 100-fold, but every one of them brings forth something because God has before ordained our good works that we should walk in them. Therefore, alleged faith that never produces works is a dead faith that cannot save. And James asked the question, can this kind of faith save him? And the answer is no if it has no works. Faith without works is dead. And that's what brings us back to the covenant of the land today. The last time that we'll be studying this, so far we've learned 28 specific things related to the covenant of the land. We've also studied the three reasons that God cast the people out of the land even though he promised to bring them back. The specific sins for which he cast them out were stubbornness, being stiff-necked, and for the rebellion against God and his word. That brought us in the study on why chastening is necessary to bring repentance both to Israel and to believers in the church today. That led to some important connections between God's love for Israel, Christ's love for the church, and the love that a husband has for his wife and the joyful submission of the wife to her husband. We had a study there about marital relationships as it ties into the principle, the overarching principle, by which God governs all of his creation. We learned three key lessons. Number one, we learned how God deals with Israel as an elect group of people and gives a visible illustration through Israel how God deals with us as elect individuals because he loves us and he wants us to be in fellowship with him. We saw that in Romans chapter 11. The second lesson that we learned was God is the one who sovereignly works repentance in the heart of man in his time. And that's the doctrine of election and predestination applied in the sphere of time and space. Predestination and election always have practical application, both to real history and in real history. And God uses his people to be his instruments in doing it. And by the way, God moves his hand at the prayers of his people. And that's one of the reasons God has commanded us in 1 Timothy 2 to make intercessory prayer our number one priority. I hope you are praying about the upcoming election on Tuesday. All over the United States, there are elections taking place. There are key people being put into positions of authority in this nation. And there will be a balance of power that is somehow modified on Tuesday as different people get into office 
And you know that we're at a critical tipping point right now in this country with all of the homosexual marriage, quote unquote, what a misuse of that word, going on in this country, and all of the so-called rights of the sodomites being pushed, a few judges standing against it, but most of them sort of going with the flow and rolling along with it. I hope you understand that every nation in history that has officially declared sodomy to be its cultural standard and norm has been destroyed within 20 years or less. People, we're talking the United States of America today. I hope you vote on Tuesday. If not, you will give an account someday before God, and you may give an account here by suffering the consequences of your failure to vote. I encourage you to vote and to make an informed decision. You've had voter's guides for three weeks in a row. I hope you read them. I hope you determined which candidates stand for the positions most closely aligned with the Word of God. Okay, enough commentary. Back to preaching. That's why we saw that it's important for husbands and wives to be in spiritual harmony and why they must pray together, not only for themselves and their children, but to be the instruments that God uses to make his sovereign impact on the world. There were six specific commands that we saw in one verse. Number one, the husbands are to dwell with their wives. Two, according to knowledge. Three, giving honor to the wife. Number four, as unto the weaker vessel. Five, as being heirs together with the grace of life. And number six, that their prayers be not hindered. We saw that in the context of the responsibility of wives to be in submission and obedience to their own husbands and the husbands to reflect the love of Christ to their wives. That's 1 Peter chapter 3 for those of you who are not with us. Paul agrees with Peter the same way in Ephesians chapter 5. We saw the position of the husband as he reflects Christ, the position of the wife as she reflects the church, the husband to be loving his wife as Christ loves the church, the wife to be in submission and subjection underneath the protection of her husband. We saw the important connection between our study of the covenant of the land and our evening series on knowing the will of God. Very important, folks. The Bible is a unit. And when you're missing part of what is going on here, you're missing part of the connections that otherwise would help you understand everything that is transpiring within the plan of God. I mean, these, these are not just messages that I make up because I have to do something on Sundays just to earn my keep. I mean, the Word of God is a unit. The Word of God is a unit. We need to understand that. The third lesson that we learned was that repentance is not a normal human response when we're confronted with sin. In fact, when I just exhorted you a moment ago, there were no doubt some excuses that came up in your minds as to why you haven't done whatever. Repentance is not even a normal human response when we're suffering because of sin. Usually we stubbornly resist and we don't want to make a connection between our suffering and our sin. Now we know that not all suffering is a result of our personal sin, but some of our suffering is a result of our personal sin. We don't like to admit that. We all suffer because sin entered into the world through Adam and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for they all have sinned. But some of our personal suffering and the suffering of others, remember that, it's not just your personal suffering, your sin also affects other people. Some of our suffering and the suffering of others is a result of our personal sin. How's your sin affecting someone else? What's it doing to someone else? I gave the example of Al Capone. I gave an illustration from an article on cognitive dissonance but written by a pagan who couldn't understand why people refuse to admit that they are wrong. The psychologist didn't understand that kind of irrational rationalization in people because he didn't understand the Bible. He left God out of the complex. But the Bible is very clear and gives a definitive twofold answer. Number one, the problem is sin, which the world does not want to admit exists. And number two, without the work of God, man does not repent, we resist. And I give you, if you remember, the illustration out of Revelation chapter 16. We see that there's a whole series of judgments taking place in the book of Revelation. First, you've got the seven seal judgments. Then you've got the seven trumpet judgments. Then you've got the seven bowl judgments. And as an angel pours out his fire on the earth, it says, Men were scorched with great heat. They blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not. Repentance is not a normal response, even when people are being judged. Therefore, God has to sovereignly give repentance in the heart of man, or man will not repent. This is going to be going through the worst time it's ever seen during the tribulation. And during the worst series of judgments, which are the bold judgments, the final group of judgments, 
Men still repent not. It says it again. It says, the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast. His kingdom was full of darkness. They gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. The natural man does not want to repent. The natural man does not want to admit that he's sinned. The natural man thinks that he's okay, that he's going to do it himself. Repentance is not a normal response to a sinful, lost human being. And unfortunately, because we as believers still have an old sin nature, repentance is not a natural response for us. It is only the grace of God that brings us to repentance, and God gives us his chastening. When we are recalcitrant and refuse to repent, God will bring his chastening because he loves us. Whom the Father loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Very important principle to learn. So when the chasing hand of God comes upon you, the first immediate thing to do, if you want God's mercy, is to repent. David committed sin with the Bathsheba. Then he committed murder by sending Uriah to the front lines and having him killed as the rest of the troops withdrew. And God was not pleased. And Nathan the prophet came into him and told him the story of a man who had a, a tender pet little lamb. In fact, they even kept it warm in bed with them at night because it was so precious. And the rich neighbor who had lots and lots of sheep had a visitor come and he thought, I don't want to kill one of my sheep. So he stole the little lamb and killed that and fed it to the neighbor. And David was furious and he said, who is that man? He's going to Pay for it fourfold. And Nathan the prophet looked him right in the eyes and pointed at him and said, Thou art the man. What was David's response? The only response that if you're wise, the only response you can give. Three words. I have sinned. Nathan said, okay, because of that, your life will be spared. See, David pronounced a death sentence. But he says, you will pay back fourfold. David lost the baby, and then he lost three more of his sons. God brings us to repentance because he loves us. Oh, that we might learn that principle before we go through the really severe chastening times of life. And so that brings us today to part 13 and lesson number 4. Let's see now how repentance fits into the prophetic future of Israel. The final repentance of Israel as a nation. We're not talking about individual Jews. There are individual Jews today who are coming to Christ and who are becoming part of the body of Christ, which is the church. We're talking about what is prophesied in the Old Testament where the entire nation, as a nation, comes to repentance and faith in their Messiah. The final repentance of national Israel and the full possession, they have partial possession right now, but the full possession of the land is scheduled to occur at the second coming of Christ. And you know, it's going to be at a time of chastening because God loves Israel just like he loves you. God loves Israel as a nation. He called them as a nation. He made them into a nation. He formed them into a group of people that are genetically related to Abraham and Sarah not to Abraham and Ishmael, or to Abraham and Keturah, or to Abraham and the concubines, which Abraham took after Sarah died. That are genetically related to Abraham and Sarah. Their offspring, Isaac and Jacob, and then the twelve tribes, the twelve sons of Jacob. A specific group of people that dwell on the face of the earth who have been persecuted throughout all of history and God formed them into a nation. He said, I'm going to make you into a final nation and you will be back in the land that extends all the way from the Euphrates River all the way down to the Nile River, the river of Egypt. It's coming, folks. God said so. It's the same God that made promises to you. If he doesn't keep his promises to Israel as a nation, that means he will not keep his promises to you. 
you better hope that he keeps his promises to Israel because otherwise you have no hope. Very important. Here we are, Deuteronomy chapter 30. We have the background to it. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1. And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whether the Lord thy God hath driven thee. Now you know we've talked in the past about the diasporas, the dispersions of the Jews. The three major uh, dispersions throughout history have occurred. Two uh, returns have occurred, and a partial return has occurred for that third dispersion. And shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day. Thou and thy children, it's going to be an intergenerational return of the heart. Not merely one generation, but an intergenerational return of the heart. With all thine heart and with all thy soul. Do you believe that God works in families? I do. Do you believe that he works in families today still? Well, Apostle Paul certainly did in Acts chapter 16. We all know the first half of verse 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And everybody quotes it that way. Did you know there's more to that verse? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Folks, God has some great and precious promises for believers. And yet we so often ignore them. God works in families. Here it's going to be not only those who remember but their children it says that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God has scattered thee if any of thine be driven out unto the uttermost parts of heaven from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee and from thence will he fetch thee do you think God is sovereign can God draw even a hard hearted disobedient stubborn individual say from Tibet and get them all the way back to China and then all the way back to Middle East and then all the way back to Israel you think God can move them each step of the way that they have to take to get back there how about if they're in Tierra del Fuego down at the bottom of South America think he might be able to get them up the coast somehow either up the west coast or the east coast and then from there, maybe get them to the United States, and then from there, maybe get them flying over to Israel. Do you think he could do it? How impotent is your God? Do you think God can do this with every living Jew on the face of the earth? Do you think it's possible? If it's possible, what did God say he was going to do? He said, I will gather you, no matter where you have been driven, any place on the face of the earth. From any of thine be driven out unto the innermost parts of heaven, from thence the Lord thy God will gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. You see, this is not the act of man. This is not a decision that they decided they wanted to go home. This is God doing it. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land. We're not talking spiritualization. We're not talking heaven. We're not talking the great beyond, the sweet by and by. Somewhere beyond the blue. The Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed. And thou shalt possess it. That seems pretty straightforward, doesn't it? I sure hope you think so. Not only that, he will do thee good. And multiply thee above thy fathers. Now the Jews really multiplied, as you can see, when they were in Egypt. The text that we have in Exodus chapter 6. In fact, they'd multiplied so much that Pharaoh got upset about it and he started, you know, killing them off and having all their boy babies thrown to the crocodiles. More than they've ever multiplied in the past. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed. Intergenerational promise here. They had the visible sign of circumcision, which is an external sign in the flesh, to show that they were part of the covenant people. It's what got them in trouble in various Gentile nations because the Gentiles could tell right away by a quick physical examination whether this person was a Jew or not. 
God said, that's not where it's really at. It was merely a sign, an external symbol about what I'm going to do inside to your hearts. Through the generative organ, the seed of life passes. And he said, I'm going to do that not merely with the external, I'm going to do that in your hearts. In the heart of your seed. And what does that mean? He tells you in the last half of the verse. To love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. Have you ever heard Jesus say those words? You did? When they asked him what's the greatest command in the law that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. This is the greatest commandment. Second likes unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We find that command as a promise stated here in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. God doesn't merely command it and they're incapable of doing that in the flesh. That's what faith is all about. Remember, we just talked about that. Connections with what we studied last week. God makes a promise that is going to happen when he draws them irresistibly from every portion of the face of the globe. You know, that's consistent. It's a theme that extends into the New Testament. God is not through dealing with his national people, Israel, the Jews. Look at Acts 3. Peter preached national repentance, restoration to the Jews in Acts chapter 3. You've heard me preach on that in the past. If you've been with us in the evening service, you've got an extended series on that. This is in the temple after healing the blame man. And of course, we find the principle established by Paul to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the gospel is first preached to the Jews. But we find it preached in the context of national repentance. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. He's talking to Jews. They're in the temple. It's the only place the Jews could be there. Nobody else could be there. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's the Hosea 6 promise. Remember we studied how the covenant of the land relates to marriage and the principles that are taught in the book of Hosea. The scripture's a unit, folks. You will find an interweaving of all of these principles. No matter where you turn, God is a consistent God. He doesn't have one set of principles over here that don't have anything to do with another set of principles he's got over here, another thing to do with a set of principles that he doesn't have over here. You'll find that they are interrelated. They are interconnected. And he shall send Jesus Christ. That's the second coming. He's preaching to Jews. The rapture hasn't yet been revealed. That's for the church, not Israel. That's the rapture before the tribulation. The second coming after the tribulation. He's preaching to Jews because the Jews are going to have to go through the tribulation, which is what we just talked about. Which before was preached unto you, which is, of course, the Old Testament. Whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things. That's a millennium preceded by the tribulation, after which Christ touches down on the Mount of Olives. Zechariah chapter 14. The whole Bible's together, folks. It's together. The rapture is when he comes and catches us up in the cloud, not when he comes and touches down on the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives splits in half. And it makes way for a fountain coming out of the Temple Mount, from the area where the, where the temple, the new Jew, millennial temple will be located, a fountain that flows all the way down through that rift, all the way down to the Dead Sea. Boy, I tell you, there, there's some incredible prophecies in Scripture if you study it. Makes the sea, which is a salt sea, a freshwater sea, though there'll still be bitter marshes on the edges. Ezekiel talks about that. People, do you study your Bibles? Do you study your Bibles with believing hearts? Do you believe that God will do what he said he's going to do? Or do you just sort of miff it off and say, oh, well, that's Old Testament. And so many just sort of brush it away and say, oh, that's Old Testament. And then they grab onto the law and put themselves back under the law. Don't get it. Anyway, let me keep preaching. For Moses truly said, Peter's preaching to Jews, remember? So he quotes Moses, Gentiles don't enter the body of Christ until Acts chapter 10. We're in Acts chapter 3 where this is happening. 
Moses said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you among your brethren. In other words, a Jewish Messiah. He's talking to Jews among your brethren. And we have seen, we've studied in the past, I hope you've been with us when I preached on Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 and 18, which is what he's quoting here. The promise of the prophet to whom you will listen. And it's quoted in the New Testament as referring to Christ. Like unto him, ye shall hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you, and it shall come to pass that every soul which shall not hear that prophet, that's the prophet prophesied by Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 and 18. That's what the New Testament says is Jesus Christ. Everyone who will hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that followed, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Samuel was a prophet. He wasn't just a priest. He was a prophet. It said, God let none of his words fall to the ground. From the time that he was a little kid until the time he actually took the place of Eli as the high priest. God did let none of his words fall to the ground. He was right every time. No mistakes. All the way from Samuel and all the prophets that followed after, as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days, ye are the children of the prophets. Ah, Peter's preaching. We're in New Testament now. Acts chapter 3. You're the children of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with our fathers. Exodus 3, we've been talking about two different covenants. We've talked about the Abrahamic covenant. We've talked about the covenant of the land. Abrahamic covenant in thy seed shall all kindreds of the earth be blessed. Part of that covenant is the covenant of the land. You can't just take part of the Abrahamic covenant. You can't just say that part of the Abrahamic covenant applies to us, but the rest of it, Israel doesn't get it. If you want to be part of the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant, and you are through the new covenant, then you have to take the rest of the covenant literally too. Peter is preaching it here in Acts chapter 3. And of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed, this is chapter 12 of Genesis, shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Which, by the way, is the same argument that Paul uses in Romans chapter 11, where he is saying that God still has a purpose for Israel, and that he's of the seed of Abraham, he's of the tribe of Benjamin, and God still has some promises for Israel. He is reserved to himself, as he quotes, speaking of Elijah, 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee unto Baal. The New Testament writers had no problem with seeing future promises for national Israel. Why should we? Verse 26, unto you first, remember the principle, unto the Jew first, unto you first, God having raised up his son Jesus, set him to bless you in turning every one of you from his iniquities. And what is turning from iniquities? Repentance. Do you see the connections? Do you see how consistent the scripture is on that? Wish you were with us when we studied Acts chapter 3 in the evening services. James reminded the Jerusalem council of the coming repentance and national conversion in Acts chapter 15. And this is after the Gentiles come in to the body of Christ in Acts chapter 10. And yet it is still being brought up at the very first church council in Acts chapter 15. Five chapters after we got Gentiles in the body of Christ. Chapter 15, verse 14. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, and to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. <laughs> God calls out some Gentiles. Are we there? Are we there? Are we there? Folks, are we there? Has God called out some Gentiles that are called by his name? Yes. Then it says, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. Does Peter here in his sermon seem to indicate that, yeah, the Gentiles have come in, but God's going to come back and he's going to do something with the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down? And he's going to build it back up again. 
Does that sound like God has given up on his plan for national Israel? That the residue, that's the faithful remnant. By the way, the word residue here in verse 17, Acts chapter 15, verse 17. That word residue is what's called a hapax legomena. Say, what in the world is a hapax legomena? Some kind of disease? No. <laughs> that means it's the only place that word shows up in the entire Bible. The only place that word shows up in the entire Bible. Kataloipos. That the residue, the kataloipos of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Remember, God is a sovereign one. He's the one who irresistibly draws whom he will at the point of time in which he will to the location where he will have them. And he predestines in those who are his elect the good works which he hath before ordained that we shall walk in them. Dear people, when God is in control and when God speaks, he doesn't stutter. He means what he says and he says what he means. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Acts 15, 18, that's the very next verse. It's God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is God who sovereignly controls the nations. It is God who sovereignly controls Israel. It is God who declared his love and placed his love on Israel and said, you are the apple of my eye. Anybody who touches you, I'm going to fry up. God said, I will chasten you. But with the cords of a man with bands of love, I will draw you back to me. And I will heal your wounds. And I will put you in your place that I promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. Let the nations rage. The heathen imagine a vain thing. The Lord who sits in the heavens will laugh. The Lord will have them in derision. Psalm 2, Psalm 110. Wish we had time to go over them. Dear people, that's our God. If he doesn't keep his promises to Israel, he will not keep his promises to us. You know, who he's quoting here in, in chapter 15 of Acts is the book of Amos, verses 16 and 17. Uh, verses 16 and 17 here of our text, rather, in Acts is quoting Amos chapter 9. Our time is almost up, but I'm going to quickly move this through. Amos the prophet says, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, and close up the breaches thereof, and will raise up his ruins, and will build it as in the days of old. That's what Peter is quoting in Acts chapter 15. That they may possess the remnant of Eden, and all of the heathen, which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. They're going to even get the land of Edom, which was promised to Esau. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. And I think all of you know that truth from having heard and sung, perhaps, Handel's Messiah. You know, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill made low. That's out of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 4. Every valley shall be exalted, every hill and a mountain and hill shall be made low. That's the same thing that Amos is saying. All the hills shall melt, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. Quoted again in Luke chapter 3, verse 5. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, the rough way shall be made smooth. You see this is a consistent theme in scripture? You see that God is going to change the topography of the earth? You see it's going to be literal? It sure is quoted that way as you go through scripture. It's quoted that way in Acts, it's quoted that way in Isaiah, it's quoted that way in Luke. We find it there in Amos. We find John the Baptist preaching repentance to national Israel. Remember, scripture is an indivisible unit, but always connects the dots. And we find that's the context in which that Luke 3, 5 passage is quoted. It's John the Baptist, the son of Zacharias, coming into the wilderness, and he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance and remission of sins. As it is written in the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. That's prepare the way for Jehovah. And John's preparing the way for Jesus. Make his path straight. 
Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, the crooked shall be made straight, the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The end of the Amos passage, it's a literal physical return, it's a literal physical blessing of the Jewish people. Verse 14, and I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities. That's not figurative, that's not allegorical. They shall inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards. This is literal. They shall drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit thereof. How much more detail does he have to get to make you convinced that this is literal and not allegorical? And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. You heard me make mention of this kind of thing in the past, but folks, I don't know how else you can interpret that. I mean, it's a clear statement repudiating what's called replacement theology. Replacement theology is very, very prevalent in reform circles today. Replacement theology says the church has replaced national Israel and God has abandoned all of his promises to national Israel. In other words, the Jews have no more claim to anything or any of the promises of God as a nation for the land or for any other reason. God says otherwise. There is coming a day, a literal day, where the wolf shall also dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together and the little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Those of you who were with us at the youth rally where we had talked about the animals in the scriptures, and I preached on the lion of the tribe of Judah, and I gave you that illustration of the Tsavo lions who were man-eaters who ate dozens and perhaps more than a hundred people. They actually stopped the, the cross-continental railroad of Africa that was being put in because they killed and ate so many people. And there are pictures of them. They were finally shot, and they're in the museum in Chicago today. They're stuffed carcasses. The scripture says, the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp. That's a poisonous serpent. The weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. Jesus claimed to be the fulfillment of that verse, verse 10, Isaiah chapter 11. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I, and I will give you rest. He's the Messiah who will give you rest. And it shall come to pass in that day, verse 11, that the Lord shall set his hand against the second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam. These are real places, folks. And from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. Doesn't matter where they've been driven out from under heaven. He will recover the remnant of his people. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now, I promise you that this is the last time that I'm preaching on this subject, at least within the context of this passage. But I didn't tell you how long I was going to preach. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'm coming to the end of it now. Jesus prophesied Israeli repentance in Matthew 24. I encourage you to read it sometime, starting in verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation, there's going to be a literal tribulation on earth. Immediately after the tribulation of the days of the sun shall be darkened and so on. The sign of the Son of Man is going to appear in heaven. He's going to come back. Israel is going to be established as a nation. People have a question about that last verse, verse 34. Let me just give you some quick answers to it. The last verse says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. That phrase, this generation, that's what has led to the group of people today called preterists. They say, okay, that means that all of this had to be fulfilled before the Jews who were alive at that time died. 
And so, since Titus, the Roman general Titus, not the guy to whom Paul wrote the book of Titus, but the Roman general Titus, surrounded the city of Jerusalem, he besieged the city of Jerusalem, he killed anybody who tried to get out of the city of Jerusalem, and he finally destroyed the city of Jerusalem, and he did it in 70 AD. Therefore, the prophecy of Matthew 24 was fulfilled in 70 AD by Titus, and therefore, all the rest of the prophecies, we don't have to worry about all the rest of the prophecies, it all got done there, 70 AD, over and out, you know, hey, we all just sort of float along now. Dear folks, is that what Jesus was saying here? It's very important word, this generation. In fact, it occurs 16 times in the New Testament in some very key passages that we find. But if you look at the context, never take a text out of context on a pretext. If you look at the context of the passage, you see the preterism rips those words out of the context of the passage. Because the context is verses 32 and 33, the two verses that immediately precede Jesus saying, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And that is the parable of the fig tree. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when ye shall see these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. The parable of the fig tree is the context for knowing that it is near. What is the parable of the fig tree? Now we've done some extensive studies in the past, wish you had been with us when we had studied that, on how the fig tree is used by Jesus and many places else in the Bible as a symbol for, get it, national Israel. We've studied that. If you didn't hear them, harass me to try to find those tapes for you and I'll make you copies if you don't believe that the fig tree is national Israel. After the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, remember this, after the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Jesus cursed and withered a fig tree to show how Israel would be judged for rejecting the Messiah. And if you want to jot down some references, that's Matthew chapter 21, verses 19 through 21, and Mark chapter 11, verses 13 through 21. He also gave us the additional parable of the fig tree in Luke chapter 13, verses 6 and 7. But here he prophesied the restoration of the fig tree. In other words, he prophesied the restoration of national Israel. And that's the context of verses 32 and 33, which immediately follow that text that the preterist ripped out of its context. Learn the parable of the fig tree. He gave the parable of the fig tree in Luke 13, 6 and 7. Learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. It's a restoration of the fig tree that's been cursed. That's why it's putting out leaves. That's why its branches are growing. God promised a restoration to Israel. That refutes preterism. That should give us, by the way, some eager anticipation for our generation. Because Israel as a nation was reborn on May 14th, 1948. It was a nation that was born in a day, literally, as prophesied by Isaiah chapter 66 verse 8. Right now the branch is tender. Right now the branch is putting forth leaves. That means, folks, that the return of the Lord is near. When you shall see these things, what things? The branch being tender, putting forth his leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you shall see these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation, the generation that sees that, shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Some of you are before that generation. I'm after that generation, and some of us here are after that. You know, we, we got started in there. That generation of those of us who saw those things happen will not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Do you believe that God tells us the truth? Do you believe that he keeps his word? 
Do they believe he's capable of keeping his word? Literally? Specifically? Exactly? Folks, I do. The covenant of the land is a specific, literal land grant. I was going to read you about 30 different verses just from the book of Genesis alone that specifically emphasize the land. I won't. I'll stop the series on the covenant and the land at this point. But you know, there are additional interwoven promises that support the literal promised covenant of the land. If we took time, there are at least six more major areas of prophecy that guarantee that national Israel will have the entire land promised to Abraham from the Euphrates River on the east to the Nile River, that's the river of Egypt on the west, a rather big territory. We could study at least six more things. We could study how the promises of the return of the Messiah guarantee the land promises. We could study how Israel's conversion as a nation guarantees the land promises. We could study how judgment on the oppressors of national Israel implies a land and a nation. We could study how future promised national blessing to Israel implies a land and a nation. We could study how the promise of a king forever implies a land and a nation. We could study how the promise of a throne forever implies a land and a nation. We're not going to do that, at least not now. The last thought I want to leave you with, remember, this is the God who has made his promises to you. This is the God who keeps his promises. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you that you are a promise-keeping God. You are a covenant-keeping God. Your word is yea and amen. Your word is truth. Sanctify us through your truth as Jesus prayed for us in John 17. Cause us to believe your truth. Cause us to be thrilled by your truth. Cause us to be motivated by your truth. Cause us to obey your truth. Cause us to love your truth. To rejoice in your truth. And to look forward with eager anticipation to the great and precious promises of your truth. Both to us and to national Israel. Which shows us visibly that you are a God who keeps covenant with your people. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today 